you know, last week I got to, to preach that sermon. Um, and it was heavy. It was, I'm sure, heavy to listen to. It was heavy to preach. Um, it was heavy to study. Um, we are, by nature, children of wrath. That is who we are, apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. And that is Paul's message in the book of Romans. It's Paul's message, really, right? Um, but that's who we are. Uh, and so Romans 1 and 2 starts with this idea that you, know, you, you are responsible um, for, for your judgment because of your sin. You have rejected God. As Gentiles, um, as non-Jews, you are responsible because you know through creation, without special revelation, you are without excuse. But also, as Jews, as we're going to get into now, you've been given the oracles of God, and and you are also uh, you are also without excuse. And so, humanity responsible without special revelation, but humanity with special revelation is the Jewish people are also without excuse. Um, and so we'll start kind of tearing into that here in just a minute. And then, of course, after this, Paul's going to get into this great message of justification um, through faith alone. Um, the great message of the Reformation that had been forgotten in the majority of the church for over a millennia. Um, and luckily, thankfully, God brought, not luck, not luck at all, God brought that back to the forefront through the Reformation. And we are living out... Um, the Reformation's return to this great gospel. And it is this gospel, Paul's gospel in Romans, it is this gospel that the, the Reformation hinged upon. Um, and so it is a very important gospel. This uh, section that we're in, chapter 2 in particular, is written in a style. Um, if you're following along in the outline, some of you always wonder, where, where is he? Um, <laughs> this is uh, the introduction to the book, and so and this would be B. This section is written in the literary style known as the diatribe. Um, and so there is this, this dialogue, this not real dialogue that Paul's having with an imaginary person. Okay? Um, important that we understand this, though, that, that um, though these arguments are contrived, um, we can't read too much into this because certainly Paul's had these arguments with Gentiles and he's had these discussions with Jews. And also, um, we must remember that it's the Holy Spirit that is causing Paul to write this, right? So we don't want to read too much into that, but these are contrived arguments. Um, and the subject of these arguments here in chapter 2 is the Jewish nation. What is the Jewish nation? Um, there's debate here, but I think it's pretty clear. Um, everyone who judges verse 1 certainly would include the Jews. Would you agree? Um, verse 2, um, Paul says, we know. And so he includes himself in that accusation. Um, verse 4, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? This indicates God's special covenant relationship with the Jews. And then in verses 9 and 10, he makes it pretty clear. The Jew first, and also the Greek. And the primacy of the Jew in that sentence, the Jew first, and also the Greek, um, indicates that that's who Paul's speaking to. So this chapter is very much about Paul speaking to the Jews. And then in verse 17, he says this, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. So... This, this chapter is about the Jewish people. Okay, um, It's interesting to me how we can find debate on things that are pretty clear. I mean, verse 17 is pretty clear, but if you call yourself a Jew, right? So that's who Paul's talking to here. Now, I think there's application to believers. I think there's application that we can apply here. There are some things... Um, I think, for example, um, Paul says, every one of you who judges. Well, certainly that could include believers. Would you agree? Um, he says, uh, 
every one of you who judges, um, and he sets up a contrast, um, those who claim in contrast with those who believe. Um, so I, I just, in verse 5, so I think, um, I think, you know, we need to draw some, some important conclusions. For example, um, clearly a hard and impenitent heart does not refer to believers. Can you have a hardened and impenitent heart and be a believer? I would suggest not. Now, I think there are stages of that, right? I think people get involved in sin and their heart hardens. But as a person who is described as having a hard heart and being impenitent, that's not a believer. Okay? Um, someone who has wrath stored up for them on the day of wrath, that's clearly not a believer, right? The day of wrath refers to the final judgment. That's clearly not a believer. But I think that this is a useful stress test, right? And I mentioned that, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, how many of you have done a stress test before? Uh, I'm not looking forward to those days. Um, <laughs> if you've done it, there's, uh, there's not a lot of reason for me to talk about it. <laughs> you probably don't want to remember it. Uh, but stress tests on the heart are good, right? They tell us where your heart is at. And I think this passage that we're looking at today is a useful stress test for the believer. Not because it is totally applicable to the believer in all of its, again, we are not uh, uh, people that wrath is being stored up for. Um, but I think it is important for us to, to ask ourselves, are we judging and yet doing the same thing? Um, my wife uh, asked me this question a couple of weeks ago. Um, again, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on, on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the same things. Um, and uh, my wife said, do you suppose that maybe that uh, like applies to the things we watch? Or the things we listen to? Like, in other words, if you throw on a movie and you know, it's a a good romance movie. I'm throwing my wife under the bus with that one. Right? <laughs> um, but, you know, we're watching something like that and they're not married. Are we, you know, are we saying it's okay for people to do those things? And are we supporting that mentality? Um, Disney just, um, just said, just released information that they are going to have uh, a, a very prominent same-sex kissing scene. Uh, maybe it's in, is it in the, did you hear? It, it's in, yeah, Buzz Lightyear. So those of you who love the, um, oh gosh, what's the series? Um, Toy Story? Toy Story series, right? They're cute and kind of reminds us of our past with some of the toys, and we love that series. Well, the new one, Buzz Lightyear, there's going to be a homosexual kissing scene in it. Very prominently so is, of course, and they, Disney had it in, or, or, Pixar had it in and Disney removed it um, and of course with the current battle that's going on in the state of Florida um, Disney is now kind of kowtowing to those in um, uh, those employees that are upset and so they put it back in so do you go watch that are you giving acceptance to um, things that you yourself are passing judgment upon I don't know seems like maybe that's the case so again I think this is good for us as a stress test of our own heart yeah I had the thought when you're talking about stress test yeah, I told Mary, said, yeah it's very strenuous and uh, they're trying to see how your heart is but they always got a doctor right there with you yep but I've done them a couple times <laughs> and it's like hmm this is really serious stuff. Yeah, <laughs> they got right. a doctor standing here. So I'm thinking or convicted of the fact when I'm checking my heart on what I'm watching or doing and everything, I need the Savior there. Yeah, I amen. Need, I need somebody telling my heart that it can be wicked or still sinful. Yeah, then I need the truth. Yeah, I love it. That's exactly right. Okay, um, so some, some structure here in the indictment of the Jewish people. 
Um, verses 1 to 5 and 17 to 24, the Jews are under judgment for their sin. Um, in verses 12 to 16, the middle section there, the Jews are not excused because of their possession of the law. And then after that, um, after verse starting in verse 25, um, the Jews are not excused because of the circumcision. Okay, and we'll get into this a little more in depth here in a moment. Um, but the Jews made those cases. They said, look, we're God's chosen people. This is not applicable to us. We don't need to do this stuff. God has given us the law. We are the circumcision. And Paul absolutely dismantles that argument in Romans. Absolutely dismantles it. Um, and so this has led to debate, you'll remember, over the years on this book. Is this book written to the Jews? Is it written to the Gentiles? Who's it written to? Um, and we argue that it's written to people, right? To both Jews and Gentiles. Okay, so, um, so then a couple of key things here. Um, again, all people have rejected God's revelation in creation. We see that at the end of Romans 1. In Romans 2, the Jews also have rejected God's special revelation. In other words, mankind deserves God's wrath. We have rejected the revelation of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we come to this really important question um, that Paul's going to deal with later in Romans 2. So what about God's covenant with the Jews then? Like, that's actually a really, really important question. What about God's promise that He made to the Jewish people? Because a God that breaks His promises is no God to worship. God has not and will not break His promises to the Jewish people. And so, it's important that we understand that. That... Um, this question, and Paul recognizes it, he deals with it. And he says it is to the Jewish people that the oracles of God have been entrusted. Um, that it is through the Jewish people that revelation uh, about God and about His Son, Jesus Christ, has come through. Okay? So, this is really important. Now, I'm going to introduce you to, and I don't know if I did this before or not, but I want to introduce you to this debate, um, this and so here's what it's called. It's called, and maybe it's in your notes, covenantal gnomism or promissory pistism. Is that in your notes? Did I put that in there? Okay. All right. Um, so the idea, covenantal gnomism, is the idea that the, the name of the covenant. Okay, that's what that phrase refers to. Um, the Jews in the first century believed that they were saved because they were Jewish. Okay? Um, and so there was a corporate election here. Well, Paul says that's not true in chapter 2. Instead, he asserts this idea that, um, at least Moo, I've never seen it elsewhere, but Moo calls promissory pistism, which is faith in the promise. Pistism is the word for faith. Okay? So you... How dare you? <laughs> You were that kid in school, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's the idea of um, faith in the promise. And so, um, and we see this in um, uh, Romans 4, um, and then in verses 2 to 3, and again in 23 to 25, um, here's what Paul says. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not, about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So again, it's belief. It is faith. And then in verse 23, But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for trespasses and raised for our justification. In other words, Abraham's faith is what is is his salvation, right? And so it's not his works. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. And so that's what, of course, the people, the Jewish people missed. 
Um, okay, so what benefit is God's covenant to the Jews? Well, it's not the name. Um, God's covenant does not provide salvation. Um, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus says this, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees, chapter 3, verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So it's not salvation. The name isn't saving. Um, the covenant itself does not provide salvation. Salvation comes only through repentance of sin. Which is to say, salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And we see this in, in Romans 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So this, all of this is to provoke repentance. Yeah, Virginia. It's, um, I'm stunned by this, that every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit it's hewn down. It's like there is an expectation that once you're saved, there's good works going on. It's kind of like, this is kind of like the message from James. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a stress test. Yeah, there's evidence of, of your standing with Christ by what we do. The good And so the good works, what is that referring to? Well, I think it's all of the good works of Scripture. I think it's are you, does your life demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? Um, are you walking in the, the good works of Ephesians 2 that God has prepared beforehand? Are you sharing the gospel? Um, I, I think all of those things. Yeah? Okay, this may not make any sense. Uh, I'm going to throw it out there. Yeah. The circumcision in Jew is the outward sign of the covenant relationship. We're God's people, right? I think we sort of have the same phenomena today in the church, and there are denominations of people who think that the simple act of water baptism saves you. Mm -hmm. One of our family members baptized, I think, three of the grandchildren when they were younger. As far as they're concerned, these kids are saved, but yep. there's no evidence of a changed life. So I think it's almost the same corollary. This was an outward thing that we didn't you know, secure something. Yes, amen. I, and I, you know, if I were to take that even a step farther, um, because I think you're right on the money. This is what amazes me about guys that are, are so deeply respected um, in the Reformed community. Guys like R.C. Sproul, who is who was a stud. I, <laughs> interesting language. I love R.C. Sproul. Um, he spoke at Masters when I was there. The guy is incredible. Was? Is? Yeah. He's living in eternity. <laughs> um, uh, but it was incredible. And yet he was he believed in pedo baptism because it, it, it was very similar to circumcision in his estimation. Now, he would also say it did not confer salvation, um, which is good, but then you start to ask yourself, well, then why are you doing it? Yeah. Right? Like, so, um, and that is what set us as Baptists apart. You know, we've gotten into this debate sometimes, and I, I've said it, and I don't know that I regret saying it, but I don't know that I still say it. Right? And that is the idea that you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Baptist. I'm a Christian. Um, I don't know that necessarily I, I would still say that. I mean, I, I do, but I don't. In other words, I am... I, I, I am I, so Brian and I, I think we've always gone to Baptist churches. I, I don't know when you were in Oregon if you did, but we've always gone to Baptist churches. I never went there because, because they were Baptist and I'm a Baptist. But I went there because there is a presumption of some good theology at Baptist churches, right? Um, and so, now, as I've gotten older, 
I'm more mature. I've recognized that not all Baptist churches are created the same, right? But um, but there is solid theology in um, in many Baptist churches. Like uh, we can expect that to be the case. And I think key in that is the idea that of baptism is an outward profession of faith. <coughs> so, yeah, great point. Um, okay, Romans two. Romans 2, again, salvation comes only through um, repentance and faith. We read verse 4. Here's verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And so we raise this question then, what is the benefit of being Jewish? Is there a benefit to that? This is an interesting question. Okay? Here's what I can tell you. Romans 3, verse 1. Paul asked the question then, what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? And Paul says, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So there is great value, great benefit to being Jewish. They were trusted with the oracles of God. Of course, I think we have a, an understanding of what that is, but it's the wisdom of God's scripture that is handed down to God's people. Chapter 9, verses uh, 4 and 5, Paul says, They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. So again, scripture. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Um, now, listen, if you're a little cynical like me, sometimes you read that and you go, okay, cool, so what's the advantage again? Because we have the Word. True? And it, the Word was brought through them. But we have the Word. And Jesus Christ comes from the Jewish people, obviously, right? But that and $5 will get you coffee at Starbucks if you don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> Although, with our current inflation, it may be 7 I don't know. But, uh, so, again, I look at this and I go, what is the advantage then? Like, is there an esteemed position in heaven for Jewish believers? I, here's, here's what I can tell you. I don't know. I don't know. I know that God has made promises to Israel that he is keeping. I know that Paul says here, to what advantage has the Jew? Much in every way. And so, great. All I know is that I deserve absolute, complete, 100% all of God's wrath. I deserve every ounce of that. And so do they. And God has freed me from it. And because God has freed me from it, uh, I'm not going to be the guy who's going to sit there and go, well, maybe I can get in on some of that promise. You know, some of the special, you know, much in every way thing. I, uh, I'm just thankful that God has saved me. So... I don't know is the short of it. There, I'm telling you, there's a lot of study on this. You can go read a ton, and, and, and I did a lot of reading. And in the end, I came to, you don't actually know. Paul says much in every way. And if he wanted us to know more about it, I suspect that the Holy Spirit would have given it to us. So, yeah. You know, it, it, you've got to think about that when it says we are grafted in. And in the, you know, Jesus used the parables all the time. And when something is grafted in, somebody that knows this can correct me. But they use the original and the, the sturdy, like orange trees, are, are often grafted onto something else. And it's like it, a lot of roses are grafted in other plants. And they're still a rose. They're still a rose. But they were grafted on to something else to get to be the rose they were. So that's how I think about it. 
Yeah, sure. I, I think I think you're right. I think you know vineyards are really um, another example of that, and we see that you know bearing fruit, right? Um, those branches that don't bear fruit are cut off, um, and some have been grafted in as well. <coughs> Uh, by the way, again, you can't go very far in this without seeing the doctrine of election. Yeah. Right? And so um, I think it's important for us to see that. And again, I'm not going to, you know, to go down the theological debate side of things. The Bible teaches election. We cannot hide from that. Um, and if you choose to hide from that, you're choosing... Ooh, I should be careful here. <laughs> you're choosing to say I don't like that part about God and so I get to be God and say that doesn't work I mean I don't know how else to put it the Bible teaches election and and so it's important for us to keep that in mind and to God's glory he chooses um, you know I, as I was telling someone about this at one point um, the potter makes his own creations right and it's up to the potter to do what he wants with his creation. He may say, that creation's getting shattered. And he may say, I'm going to keep that creation and put it up in my house and do something, you know, like have light shine on it and make it like really special because I've chosen to do that. Well, the potter gets to make that decision with his creation. Um, and uh, I'm not, it's, it's not for me to say who's right and wrong. Here's what I know. Because of the doctrine of election, again, we can be assured of success in evangelism. Because God's will will be proven out in that process. Man, I'm glad to not to not be a Wesleyan, to not be an Arminian. Imagine having to talk people into salvation and it's on the quality of your message. Like that's a that's a dangerous place to be in. So praise God that God has a plan that I have good works that I'm to walk in. And one of which is to share the gospel knowing that God is sovereign. So okay. Um, so verses one to sixteen um, here, the Jews and the judgment of God. Um, we will be looking, of course, at verses one to five in this outline and making sure then um, I figured there's no reason to put the rest out here yet. We're still seven years away from it, so um, we'll just hit one through five. But okay, so there's an accusation um, that Paul makes here in verses one to five. The Jews deserve the same wrath as the Gentiles. Jews deserve the same wrath. Um, why? Because all people deserve wrath. Our works are evidence of what we deserve. That's Paul's argument in this passage. Um, he makes this argument, by the way, in the second person singular. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we have an English teacher here. <laughs> right, what does it mean to be in the second person singular? What are we saying there? Talking to the audience. Good. Okay, and in singular it is specifically one person. So Paul is saying to this, um, we would call it almost like a straw man argument, except for the straw man he's talking to is not a straw man, right? It is a representative of the Jewish nation, okay? So regardless of the covenant, Paul says to this Jewish person that he's having a discussion with, again, a contrived argument, but he says to them, regardless of the covenant, you will stand with the Gentiles in judgment. Why? Because we gave you the law. God gave you the law, and the law is evidence that you can't keep it. Right? It is your tutor. And what is the tutor supposed to be leading the Jewish people to? To Christ. To Christ. And yet you are wicked and deceitful. Um, so, explanation one. God, um, Paul says in verses 6 to 11, God is an impartial judge, judging each the same. So Jewish people, understand God's going to judge you the same way that he judges the Gentiles based upon your lack of belief. Explanation 2 comes in verses 12 to 16. Um, possession of the law doesn't spare judgment. It's not simply owning the law, but what? 
Yeah, doing keeping it. it, right? Doing it. Uh, and they can't do that because they are also depraved. Um, and Paul says in verse 14 that the Gentiles have the law written on their hearts, which is an interesting passage, by the way, um, that we'll get to later. But I just want you to think about that for a moment. That the Jews have the law, right, that God gave to Moses for the Jewish people. Gentiles also have the law. It's written on their hearts. In other words, again, that um, all are without excuse. Amen? Yeah. Um, so, again, uh, we have those two explanations. Failure to obey both for Jews and Gentiles then leads to condemnation. And Paul says here in verses 1 to 3, the Jews do the same thing as the Gentiles. You're no different. You're acting just like them. And you should know better because you have the law. Right? That's the argument. Um, they dishonor God in verses 17 to 24 by disobeying a law in which they boast. Ooh, that's one that we should probably stop and listen to. We'll get there later. But are you dishonoring God by boasting about, uh, about laws in God's word that you don't keep? Ooh. something we should think about. We boast about God's love, but we're not loving. That would be a problem. So again, are you boasting in God's law and not keeping it? Paul makes the argument that, that the Jews not only are dishonoring God because of their sin, they dishonor God specifically by boasting in a law they don't keep. Um, and then, of course, any transgression of the law negates the covenant of circumcision, right? Chapter 2, verse 25, and then again in chapter 3. Um, Moo uses this phrase, factual transgressions. In other words, we don't have to talk about the idea of a heart or, you know, you had this view in your mind, but actually factual transgressions of the law, violation of the law that you can point to exactly and by the way, did Jesus do this to the Pharisees? Yes. Right? Factual transgressions of the law deserves condemnation. And therefore, if you deserve condemnation, and again, Paul will say in verse 23 of chapter 3, for all have what? Sin. Sinned. And so because all have sinned, Jew or Gentile, there is a need for Jesus Christ for all. I'm not sure I heard you correctly, so I want to make sure I hear. Did you say that as the Jews violate the law, they, the covenant's broken with them? Is that what you said? No. Because I don't think so. Okay. No, no. Let me, let me clarify I, this. I heard that so too. I got it straight. It was a law. But let me finish. Uh, they are God's covenant people. He chose them. He pulled them from the wayside. They were bloody and messy. And he made them his own. So when he talks about these comparisons, it never does negate the covenant, like you said earlier, that they are still individually held accountable for their sin. But God right. has set aside the nation of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. God still has the plan, and he will keep his covenant with them. Yeah, the covenant to his people absolutely is 100% is in play. The individual is not. They're, they're yes, that's the key. And if I was not clear on that, that is my fault. Yes. And nor the, and corporately they're still guilty because they aren't. They haven't accepted Jesus. Unless they receive Jesus, right? There are of course Jews who believe in Jesus. They're all accountable until they do. Mm -hmm. But they they are accountable until they know Christ. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so this passage that we're looking at today. Um, deals with Jewish presumption. It's written in an accusatory style. Right? Paul is accusing the Jews of this. And again, it's a debate, a debate with this imaginary person. And it is, um, it is focused on the Jew in particular. Some have said that it's any self-righteous person. We've dealt with that already. I don't think that's the case. Although I think it is applicable to a self-righteous person. Who's an unbeliever? Chap chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, deals specifically with the Jews. Now, there's this application 
Um, there was the uh, the Roman or Greek Roman philosopher Seneca. If you go back and you study Seneca, it's fascinating. He sounds like he could be in the church. Super, super moral. And the things he said sound like things that, well, we might say. He's a pagan, absolute unbeliever, rejects Jesus Christ, but he's super moral. And so, some would say that Romans 2 verses 1 to 5 are targeted at Seneca's. People like him who are really moral. Okay, I think, I think it certainly speaks to that. But, as we've said, clearly speaks to the Jewish nation. Um, and I think Paul intentionally probably makes the argument somewhat vague. So that we all, it applies to all of us. In other words, it's directed to the Jews and they hear it loud and clear, make no mistake. That's why the Pharisees wanted Jesus crucified. Right? They hear it loud and clear. But it is applicable to us all. And it is important for us to take a look. Are we condoning things that we're judging? But the internal evidence, again, the first three verses of chapter 2 could apply to anyone. But Moo notes in verse 4 that this draws on the language from the wisdom of Solomon. Um, that, by the way, the wisdom of Solomon was an apocryphal book. Okay? Um, but he draws on language from that in chapters 12 to 15 of that, and it would make much more sense directed at the Jews. Okay? Questions there? That isn't there? the Song of Solomon? That's no. something else? It's, it's a book in the Apocrypha called The Wisdom of Solomon. It's one of the deutero-canonical books. You know, that the Jews still look for Messiah, so in a way, they haven't really, they haven't, they're still right. They just haven't accepted Jesus, because they, they have an idea that he was going to be the big conqueror right then, and... So a few years ago, I, I preached on Palm Sunday. And when I was um, preparing for that, I came across some studies done by um, rabbinical scholars. And rabbinical scholars um, began after Jesus to say, you know, maybe Jesus was the Messiah. Now, I want you to stop and hear what I just said. <laughs> rabbinical scholars saying maybe Jesus was the Messiah. What they began to do, one of the key teachings that came out of um, uh, rabbinical teaching after this, um, was that they said, well, maybe there's two messiahs. Oh. And they had Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. Ben is like of. So they had a messiah who was in the form of Joseph. That was Jesus. <coughs> right? The, the Redeemer. But, and so maybe that was him, we're still going to look for another Messiah, who is Messiah ben David, the conquering leader that, of course, Chad preached about on Palm Sunday, which, by the way, has stirred up controversy uh, among some. Right? That, that um, you know, that those folks were nationalists, which, of course, we've, been, we've talked about in here, Right? that those folks were nationalists. Like, it's important for us to remember that the Jews who were welcoming Christ in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday were the same people yelling, crucify him. Because it wasn't the Jesus they wanted. Well, I mean, guys, let's be honest. Isn't that what idolatry is? Idolatry is creating the God we want? I mean... Listen, I sat on the bus and had a student tell me that, that God created homosexuals to be homosexuals. Well, why? Why did they do that? Because that's the God they want. They don't want to take that stand. That's a hard stand to take in our society right now. You may not 
choose to go watch Buzz Lightyear because of it. Or you might be condemning of, um, uh, of, a, of a sibling. I mean, the reality is that idolatry is making the God you want. And when you have the power to make God, I, really, I guess that means that you are claiming to be God. So this whole nationalism piece, it was a group of people proclaiming Jesus to be the God that they wanted. And he thwarted that immediately, riding in on what? A donkey. Look, if that offends you, then that tells you maybe what your idolatry is. I don't know how else to put that. Because those same exact people, they were very clear about their idolatry just a few days later when they chanted, crucify him. See, the Jewish people, rabbinical scholars, are like, man, we didn't get the Jesus we wanted. Well, rather than say, do I need to look at then, is my view of Jesus wrong? They just said, well, I'll create another Jesus. And this can be that Jesus, and my Jesus is still coming. <clears throat> still idolatry. They have separated out the natures of Jesus to create the Jesus they wanted. It's no different than anyone else in society right now. If they're looking for the Messiah to come, that doesn't mean the thing. Because, like it says in John chapter 1, he came into his own, but his own received him not. So right yep. now, no Jew can be saved, even thinking the Messiah can come. Because he would have Amen. faith in him now. And him the Messiah, Messiah has, has come. come. Exactly, and that's the only way they're going to escape judgment. Yep, yep. The, see, and that's the key, right? So they, and I, I wouldn't say this is true of all Jews, but it was true certainly of this rabbinical study that I was doing. Um, they have divided out. In other words, they've said the Messiah has not come. Well, very clear, at least not in fullness. And so very clearly, they have rejected the Messiah. Yep. And so... I, I just, you know, I think it's important that we come back and we take a look at that, that, that we understand the Messiah came in fullness. And that, by the way, if we're honest, should force us to look at the fullness of our life. And is the Messiah impacting the fullness of our life? Is the Messiah not only, not only affecting our politics... But is in, is in fact the Messiah leading us to belief about how we act within our political structure? I was talking with someone the other day about, um, uh, about civil disobedience. Is civil disobedience scriptural? Yes. Well, I, I mean, scripture's pretty clear. Submit to, to government. Unless that, what? That which belongs to the government. Un unless what? Unless government is calling upon you to violate God's law. And if government calls upon you to violate God's law, should you be disobedient? Yes. That disobedience, though, better not be necessarily revolution. I said necessarily. See, we're all softening this thing. Better not be revolution. It better be practicing the fruit of the Spirit. If the fruit of the Spirit is not obvious in your civil disobedience then there's a question there for you. And so, as we look at these things, the, the central question is, do you believe in Christ and Him crucified? And, if you actually do, is that impacting your life? Or, are you like the Jews who are practicing the same things you do?